Chapter 8 Hungary Patriotic Reactions The disintegration of the Habsburg monarchy in 1918 left Hungary isolated and beleaguered, retaining less than a third of the territories she had once ruled. Of 282,870 square kilometers, she kept 91,174, and of a population of 18 million, only 8 million were left. The brief communist regime of Bela Kun, dislodged by Romanian troops, was succeeded in 1919 by a right-wing reaction. The Red Terror by a White Terror, which settled down by 1920 to the highly conservative rule of aristocratic cabinets headed mostly by great landed magnates. Two attempts of Emperor Charles of Habsburg to seize the crown were repulsed in March and October 1920. Hungary remained a monarchy, but one from which the kings continued to be excluded, and where the memories of St. Stephen's crown were preserved in the person of the regent, a former Austro-Hungarian admiral, Miklos Horthy. In this rump of an empire, ruled by a former imperial aristocracy, socially displaced persons formed an important group. Ex-officers of the imperial armies, teachers and administrators who had been employed in large numbers in territories now within Yugoslav, Czech or Romanian borders, refugees from those lands and, in time, students, many of humble origins turned out by high schools and universities in greater numbers than before the war. All these responded to the irredentist appeal of a Magyar nationalism, exacerbated by defeat. Unrelenting irredentism, Hungary's claims to the lands she had lost, would be the leading theme of all Hungarian politics after the Treaty of St. Germain in 1919. Against this background, a number of patriotic societies sprang up, many of them secret. All aimed to reverse the verdict of the war and to restore Hungary's past greatness. The first of these societies and movements was organized in 1918 to 1919, among the anti-Bolshevik forces who were concentrated in southeastern Hungary around the town of Szeged, near the Serbian border. Their point of view became known as the Szeged idea, an idea, or rather, a set of attitudes which would be basic to all later nationalist or fascist movements that the country would know between the wars. Having lost all they had in revolution or in flight, most of the representatives of the Zagat idea felt no particular respect for property and inclined to believe that the greater part of Hungary's wealth was in the hands of big landlords and Jews, for whom they bore no sympathy. They were anti-Semitic because they equated the Jews with exploitation and the money power, and also because many of the radical intellectuals of the liberal Karolyi government of 1918 and many more of the commissars of Bela Kun's Red Republic of 1919 were alleged to have been Jews. Above all, they were counter-revolutionary and, naturally, anti-Bolshevik, wanting to defend Hungary's borders against the foreigner and protect her internal stability against the revolution. The stability which they envisaged, however, was not that of the old order. In many respects, these nationalists of Zaged could be described as leftists, and they might so have described themselves if the term had not been smeared for them by its associations with socialism, internationalism, and Jews. Instead, they called themselves, in quotations, right wing, end quotations, or, in quotations, right radicals, end quotation. This, Professor McCartney tells us, was going to have peculiar consequences. In quotations, the ultra-conservative landed and big business interests were left without an appropriate label. Hungarians not infrequently called them, in quotations, left, end quotations, and the English pen, which boggles at following the example, is left at a loss for an alternative. End quotation. Gombosch. The representative leader of those right radicals whose programs and methods came very close to those of the radicals of the left would be Giola Gombosch, in brackets 1886 to 1936, end brackets, born in a Swabian district, the son of a schoolteacher who may well have been of German stock and of a local farmer's daughter who did not speak Hungarian at all. Like many people of doubtful descent, in brackets, de Grel's father's family came from the region of Maubeuge in France, his mother's family from German Moselle, 
Kudrenu's father, named Zelinsky, was Polish or Ruthenian. Hitler, of course, was an Austrian. End brackets. Gombosch early became a truculent Hungarian nationalist. A captain in the war, at Zagad, he had been appointed Minister of Defense, and, after Horthy's regime had been securely established, he resigned from the army to become a politician, the chief spokesman of the Zagad idea, and, for the last four years of his life, prime minister of his country. Gombosch spoke of himself as a Hungarian National Socialist as early as 1919, and he took his National Socialism very seriously, although it meant in part war against the false socialism of Marxism. In quotations, a destructive heresy foisted on simple workers by self-seeking international Jews. End quotation. Opposed to corrupting Marxism, he was, however, just as opposed to landlords and to financiers, attacking inherited privileges and the caste system, favoring radical land reform, and declaring that he recognized no difference between classes. He once shocked Parliament by affirming that his generation had no use for counts unless they worked, in quotations, when they would be treated like everybody else, end quotation. And he carried these principles into practice in 1932 by forming the first Hungarian cabinet, which did not include a single count. As early as 1921, his anti-Semitism and his irredentist conspiracies brought Gombosch into contact with like-minded groups in Munich, in brackets, where Hitler was then busy as an obscure hanger-on, end brackets, including the original National Socialist Workers' Party, white Russians, Ukrainians, and German and Bavarian nationalists. But Gombosch did not like the Germans, and his vaguely social patriotic ideas developed into a doctrine only in the late 20s under the impact of Mussolini, from whom, in brackets, despite the fascists' regrettable lack of anti-Semitism, end brackets, he seems to have borrowed the idea of leadership in an integrated, corporative state. As Gombosch rose to power in the early 30s, his policies in which even the anti-Semitism had been toned down by the necessity of government became too moderate for a new generation whose socialism and nationalism were more uncompromising. The high school and university graduates of the post-war years cared nothing for the social system which their parents and their conservative rulers still accepted. In quotations, some of the most penetrating and also the most radical works on Hungarian social conditions, end quotations, writes McCartney, in quotations, came from men who were afterwards penalized as war criminals and their works burned as fascist, end quotations. Yet such men could not gravitate towards the classic left. For one thing, the position was still identified with the anti-national revolution of 1918 to 1919. For another thing, it was uncomfortable. The Communist Party had been outlawed and the Social Democrats were far too liberal and internationalistic for the young men's taste. Also, the left was not anti-Semitic, whereas the middle classes were profoundly so, both by prejudice and by economic considerations, the Jews seeming to bar their way in many businesses and liberal professions. Although anti-Semitism kept many radicals from going left, it also kept them from the conservative government party, whose economic ties with Jews were too close and whose prejudices were too weak for it to countenance any serious anti-Semitic action. Their sympathies would go to the nationalist, socialist parties of the 30s. The latter, however, drew much of their rank and file support from the urban and rural proletariat, a class to whom anti-Semitic appeals meant little, but radical reform meant a good deal. Thus, Hungarian National Socialists appealed to the middle classes by their anti-Semitism and to the workers by their radicalism. And a great many radicals of the right who wanted to change the whole political and social structure of the nation would find in Nazism as they saw it across the German border, and quite apart from its anti-Semitism, the hope for drastic remedies which middle class reformers had promised but failed to carry out. The political parties that sprung up in the 30s are easily confused because they bore similar labels and were often amalgamated only to split again, or disappeared to revive under another name, Scythe Cross or National Socialist Party of Labor, which simply took over the Nazi program, 1931. 
the Hungarian National Socialist Agricultural Labors and Workers' Party, with its brown shirts and its green swastika on a brown field, 1932. The Hungarian National Socialist People's Party, 1933 and the Hitlerite National Socialist Party, which imitated the whole Nazi pattern from swastika to jackboots, 1933. And then, some more. By 1934, the chief formations had adopted the distinctive marks of Hungarian National Socialism, the green shirt and the arrow cross badge. Soon they would crystallize around the person of one man, Ferenc Zelasi, 1897-1944. Zlasi's ancestors came of Armenian stock, for many Armenians had immigrated to Transylvania in the 18th century. But his grandfather, who moved to Vienna, found a small job on the railways and chose an Austrian wife, had changed his name from Salostian or Salogian to a more Hungarian consonance. Ferenc's father had been a non-commissioned officer in the Imperial Army. His mother was of mixed Hungarian and Slovak origin. Ferenc, after serving in the war, entered the Hungarian army and was appointed to the general staff in 1925, where he soon gained the reputation of being a, in quotations, military revolutionary, end quotation. He studied politics and sociology and read Marx, Babel, Kropotkin, Lenin, and Trotsky so thoroughly that he was always able to quote passages from their works. He investigated the possibilities for action of the opposition parties, in brackets, including the Social Democrats, end brackets, and resigned from the army in 1934 to devote himself to political activity. Zelasi's great idea was, in quotations, Hungarism, end quotation, the dream of uniting the peoples of the, in quotations, Great Carpathian Danubian Fatherland, end quotation, with the peoples from Ruthenia to the Adriatic, a kingdom where the Magyars would be dominant, in brackets, as the chosen people, and brackets, but not exclusive. The first instrument for the realization of this ideal would be the Party of the National Will, which he founded in 1935, dedicating it to, in quotations, the Trinity of Soil, Blood, and Work, end quotations and then the Arrow Cross Party, which he set up to succeed it. In brackets, see reading number 3A, end brackets. Zelasi's dream of the triumph of Hungarism took precedence over whatever means he could find to fulfill it. The party's purpose was to carry him, the leader, to power, but this power was to be achieved, in brackets, and Zelasi insisted on this and remained true to it, end brackets, in quotations, by the common will of the nation and of the head of the state, end quotations. For Zelasi wanted to take power by constitutional means, against the existing parliamentary parties, certainly, which did not derive their power from the freely expressed will of a people who had never seen free elections, let alone a secret ballot, but not against the people themselves, nor against their constitutional head, the regent, Horthy. In quotations, the people, end quotation, were crucially important not only as the many-headed symbol of national reality, but also because Lassie realized that their support was crucial in the event of a war. At such times, everything had to go with perfect smoothness and national resources had to be exploited to their utmost. One could not risk the chaos of even a 24-hour strike. Essential to national security as to the national welfare, the workers must not be allowed to, in quotations, be led astray on account of material or ideological questions into paths dangerous and fatal to the state, end quotation. Social justice was important, but social integration was more important still. Workers had to be taught that they were one with the state, their state, in quotations, so that when the hour came, they would identify themselves with it and work to realize its objectives as their own. End quotation. Marxism was powerful and impressive, but it overlooked national interests for class interests, and it took its orders from Moscow. The barren materialism of Marxism could bring Hungary nothing. The equally materialistic slogans of a weak liberalism which the people knew largely as the harbinger of injustice provided no satisfactory rejoinder. 
the only match for Marxism lay in National Socialism, with which Zlasi appealed to the workers with some effect. In the election of May 1939, the first to be conducted with a secret ballot, various National Socialist groups won 48 out of 259 parliamentary seats. 31 of these seats went to Zlasi's Arrow Cross. Though holding less than a fifth of the seats, the National Socialists had received 750,000 of the 2 million votes cast, and in Budapest, their 72,383 votes compared favorably with the government party's 95,468. Just outside the capital, Chepel, which was also known as Red Chepel because it boasted the greatest industrial concentration in the country, elected two National Socialists. Mistrusted by the Hungarian conservatives because of his ambitions and his revolutionary program, unable to come to an understanding with the Nazis because of his uncompromising Hungarist principles, Zlasi could not secure either the support of the moderate regent or that popular endorsement without war for which he hoped. Hungary's alliance with fascist Italy in 1927 had been signed by conservatives. It was conservatives who negotiated with Hitler in 1938, 1940, and thereafter, and conservatives again who, in the early months of 1944, delivered to the Germans the greater part of Hungary's Jews. The Arrow Cross, however, made its influence indirectly felt. Largely under its pressure, conservative governments reluctantly started distributing land to the peasants. More significantly, in trying to counteract the party's vigorous activity, which, according to a French observer, was winning sympathies, in quotations, not only in the country proletariat, but among students, poor intellectuals, and officers, end quotation, Gombosch's successors adopted many of its essential points and methods. Thus, even though the Arrow Cross remained out of power, its ideas left their mark on the Hungarian political and intellectual scene. Even Zlasi's imprisonment in the late 30s for anti-constitutional activities did not prevent the Arrow Cross's parliamentary representation increasing, and its ideas shifting the center of gravity of the conservative government coalition well towards the right. Meanwhile, left to his lieutenants, the party had begun to flourish on German money and... While the Arrow Cross became known as a, in quotations, German, end quotations, party, it also welcomed communist supporters. Soon, the Arrow Cross was riven between opportunistic pro-Nazis who blamed Zlasi for tolerating communists and, even more, for refusing all concessions to the Germans and, on the other side, radical members who accused him of forgetting the party's old social program. What everyone had forgotten was that the social program or political maneuvers had been for Zlasi merely aspects of a much wider dream. In its pursuit, and after being freed from prison, the leader purged his party as well as he could, of both the opportunists and communists, even though this meant losing a great deal of strength in parliament and in the country. However, Zlasi, unmoved by such mundane considerations, was busy working out plans for the eventual organization of his Hungarist corporate estate, including such refinements, McCartney tells us, as a compulsory anthropological examination for all officials. By the end of 1943, when membership had sunk below 100,000 and the party's spirits were very low, Zlasi worked out plans for an institute of racial biology. The following summer, he sent Hitler elaborate plans for a tribal reorganization of Europe. Momentary difficulties did not worry him. He felt certain that his time would come, and it soon did. Hungary had been dragged into war much against her will, by German pressure and by her military leader's ambitions. At the beginning of 1944, unsuccessful efforts to get the country out of the conflict led to the German occupation of the country, the suppression of all but right-wing parties, and an influx of new members into the Arrow Cross. And... While the middle classes and the army contributed their share, workers were not the least numerous among those who joined it. Zlasi's had been the only right-wing movement seriously to bother with, in brackets, and about, and brackets. The workers, although many, of course, clung to socialism or entered the communist underground. A goodly number joined the Arrow Cross. Zlasi's own reaction to the new circumstances was characteristic. 
His was the only party to demonstrate and scatter leaflets against the German occupation and against the collaborating Zdoche government, which obeyed them. Zlasi himself was willing to take power, in quotations, by will of the people, end quotations, and to lead the nation against Bolshevism, but on condition that the Germans integrally accept his hungerist ideas and give his policy full reign. The Germans, like most Hungarian politicians, thought he was crazy. They preferred to deal with other national socialist groups whose policy consisted largely of anti-Semitism and collaboration. But... While rejecting cooperation with other factions of this subservient right, vigorous arrow cross propaganda was making converts among the working classes. And the prophet's hour came at last when, in October 1944, Horthy, negotiating for an armistice, was forced to abdicate and interned by Germans, and Zlasi was in power. While waiting for this moment, the leader had prepared a complex plan to organize the nation into corporations nationalize mines and power stations, place industry and trade under state control, mechanize agriculture and break the money power's hold upon it, employ the Jews on public works and then settle them elsewhere after the war. In quotations, the corporatist order of the working nation, end quotations, kept the new head of state and his ministers busy, but little could be done to implement it for Hungary had been overrun by Russian armies, and Budapest was soon encircled in a siege that was to last until the end of winter. While the troops fought and the city starved, while bands of hooligans and Arrow Cross militia tortured and massacred Jews and political opponents, Zelasi himself, in quotations, retired completely into the clouds, end quotations. Dictating his memoirs, commandeering newspaper presses to print Arrow Cross theoretical works, attending seances where optimistic spirits predicted the downfall of the Western powers. His mind, almost unhinged, dwelt in spheres of high policy and constitution making far removed from the desperate situation of that bloody winter. Before long, he would be tried and executed by the victors for the acts of treason and terror committed in his name. The man, however, was neither brute nor traitor, but, as McCartney puts it, a person, in quotations, of the most unyielding principles, on which he insisted with a maddening monotony and a rigidity which rejected the slightest compromise, end quotations. Even with reality, the man was mad. <laughs>